Okay, peeps, so we talked about transdynamic acid in the previous video, and we said that it, by definition, is an acid. So we have a hydrogen that can be spit off, and that hydrogen will go off in transdynamic acid case at 4.4. So if the pH is greater than 4.4, then this thing is going to turn into an acid, and it's going to spit off a proton for the reaction to use. Now, I want to go on and talk about the next reagent that you're going to be using in the laboratory and this is liquid bromine and the reason that I want to kind of talk to you about liquid bromine is because this is one of I would say the most hazardous compound that you will use this summer so up at the top you're gonna to see a flask and that flask is filled with bromine and bromine is a liquid at room temperature but here's the problem Bromine's a liquid at room temp, but its boiling point is very close to room temperature. So what that means is that if I pour liquid bromine out into a flask, and if that room is slightly warm, or if the flask is slightly warm, then that liquid will change into a vapor, and it will escape the flask, and that's what you're seeing up at the top. So we don't want this to happen. We need to use liquid bromine in this reaction, but if we just add liquid bromine the way that it is, it's going to be very hard for us to keep it in solution and for us to react with it. So for that reason, we have to put liquid bromine into what we call a carrier solvent. So your carrier solvent here is not water. So never ever add water to liquid bromine. Don't breathe it in and never add water to liquid bromine. And the reason is because the water will react with the Br2 molecule and typically it will form hydrobromic acid. And that hydrobromic acid can spit, it can splatter, and you can easily breathe that in and that will give you chemical pneumonia. Not only that, but liquid bromine can also have long-term central nervous system depression. So what goes on is that people that work with liquid bromine over a course of time, the, the, what we would call the half-life is very long. So it stays in your system and it will accumulate. And over time as you absorb more and more bromine, your symptoms get worse and worse and worse. So you never really want to expose yourself to liquid bromine at any point in time for a long period of time. Okay, So there's a proper way to handle this. We're going to have to use liquid bromine. Bromine. There's no way around it. And we don't want it to vapor like it's doing up here at the very top of the picture. So what we do is that we pick out a carrier solvent. That carrier solvent is not going to be water. Instead, it's going to be glacial acetic acid. So what that means is that the lab is going to tell you, make this solution, and it gives you a molarity of bromine. And it will say, but make sure that you put it in glacial acetic acid. That's the carrier solvent. So you treat these problems just like always. Take your molarity problem, figure out how much you want to make, solve for mole, and then use that mole, convert it to formula weight that gives you gram of bromine, and then when you get gram of bromine, you can use the density value to convert that to milliliter of bromine that you need to measure out. Bromine's a liquid, so we probably would need to measure milliliters, right? So when I take this bromine, instead of putting it in water in a volumetric flask, I'm going to put it in glacial acetic acid instead. And the acetic acid will basically take what you're seeing up here at the top, and it will change it into something that you see down here in the bottom. So notice the vapors are not there anymore. The acetic acid has trapped the Br2 molecule in the solution. It's not going to go anywhere, and that way it's going to be ready for our reaction when we begin to add two uh, add it to the boiling flask. Now, there's another trick here that we need to tell you about, and that's to make bromine cold in the very beginning. Uh, notice I told you that the boiling point for bromine was about room temperature. So if we can take our bromine container, and if we can put that into like an ice water bath, then we can get this stuff really, really cold, and it's not going to basically fume on us when we begin to work with it. So before you make this solution at all, Put your bromine container in a ice bath and let it sit there for, you know, 10, 20 minutes. Let it get super, super cold. And then go and pour that out into a graduated 
a cylinder or a volumetric flask, whatever you need to use to make your solution, and it will stay as a liquid. For the most part, it will stay as a liquid until you're ready to use it. So that's a little bit of background about liquid bromine. Just be careful with it when you use it in the laboratory and you'll be fine. Now here's the setup that you're going to be using in the laboratory. So down here at the bottom is a bowling flask and this bowling flask will have another neck on it and that neck is going to be the attachment of a separatory funnel. So the separatory funnel will hold your liquid bromine here and you're going to slowly add the liquid bromine into the solution as the reaction proceeds. So that's the reason that we do that. It's, it's right there, it's jointed, uh, we have access to add things in that bowling flask over a course of time as the sample begins to heat, right? Uh, up here at the very top, that's your condenser. That's always the condenser that we use. So this is going to be a reflux condenser. Water in from the bottom and water out from the top and you'll be fine. Notice over here to the side, you want to add the bromine in portions. You have to take it very, very slow. Uh, if you've done another lab like this one, um, which was probably the Makovnikov lab, you had to use iodine in that laboratory assignment, right? Uh, and we told you to add it in small portions. The same thing's going to happen here. Bromine's going to be colored. You're going to add the colored solution in the bowling flask. That color is slowly going to disappear. And when you think all the color or the majority of the color is gone, on, they're going to tell you to add another portion of bromine, and that's what you want to do. You also want to monitor the temperature just like before in the Makovnikov lab, uh, so if you've done that one so far. Uh, so you're going to monitor the temperature. Anything over 50 degrees is bad. You don't want this thing to get too hot. Uh, so have an ice bath ready to go, so that way you can switch out your heating mantle into a ice bath and cool it down a little bit, but never make it go over 50. Uh, place the, um, uh, at the end of the reaction, place the boiling flask in an ice bath and you're going to crystallize some product. Uh, so a solid will form, it will be a solid product here, and that solid product you will have to test for identity purposes. Uh, you're going to rinse those crystals after you vacuum filter them. So pour them through a Buckner funnel and then pour the solvent through, make sure all your crystals have fallen out, and capture all of them. But those crystals are going to have a very vinegary smell. And the reason for that is the glacial acetic acid that is used in the experiment. So we want to make sure that all the solvent has been rinsed off of those crystals. And that's why the statement here on the slide and maybe in your lab experiment is going to say, rinse it until you smell the vinegar go away. So give it good flushes with DI water. Uh, you want to keep smelling of it. See if you can find that very sour vinegar smell. And if you can, that means you need to rinse this stuff even more than what you're doing. Uh, so it might take a lot of DI water, but be patient. It will finally rinse clean. Uh, the glacial acetic acid is quite stubborn to get off of those crystals. You're then going to purify those crystals. So you're going to take those crystals. You're going to go through recrystallization. The lab experiment will tell you how to go through the recrystallization crystallization step and you're going to produce a pure product in the very end. So finally, what's the goal of the lab? Well, bond triplex makes alkynes through the bromination of alkenes, uh, like transdynamic acid, that is an alkene, right? And the dehydrohalogenating the compound. So basically what that statement means is that this company takes a molecule like transdynamic and they break the double bond and they add bromine onto the molecule. And those two bromines will then get removed again, and a triple bond will form, and that's how they make an alkyne. So the company is unsure of the mechanism, and they do not know if the molecule is added on in an anti-fashion or syn fashion, uh, which basically means the trans form or the cis form. They don't really know what goes on in the mechanism process, and it's up to you to find out. So with the first step, taking an alkene and brominating it, two products could possibly form. The urethro version, dibromide, which the bromines are on the same side, or the 3 version, which is the bromines on the opposite side. So you've got to think of those as cis and trans, right? All right, so if I drew that out for you, just so that you can kind of follow through with us, uh, here is the carbon 
and double bonded to the carbon in the transdynamic acid. So here I'm just going to, um, uh, let me not do that. Uh, I'm going to uh, just draw the area around that double bond. I'm not going to draw the entire molecule because that will just confuse you even more. So I don't want to do that at all. All right, so here's the um, double bond in the transdynamic acid. And that double bond is going to break. And the reason is because it's a double bond. And if we give it the right circumstances, then two sites of attachment will open up. Uh, these two sites of attachment are going to be the new ones. So here I'm going to put R groups. They can be anything that they want to be. It can be carbon chains, it can be hydrogens, it can be OH groups, whatever the case, who cares. Uh, so for that reason, uh, these two new sites open up that wasn't there before. And they have an option on what to do. They can either go on the same side or they can go on opposite sides, right? And this would be the cis form and this would be the trans form. They're opposite of each other or they're on the same side. So with this molecule of transdynamic acid, you're adding bromine and bromine is a Br2 molecule. So what happens is that the bromine will split in two, two pieces. And one bromine will go on one carbon and the other bromine will go on the other carbon. So our two options is to have bromine on the same side or bromine on the opposite side. And it's up to us to figure out how this mechanism takes place. Now, I've said in a previous video that most of the time, trans is the one that gets formed because that's the most stable, especially if the groups are very large like bromine, right? Bromine has a very large atomic number. It's a very big molecule, so they're going to be preferred to stay apart from each other. But sometimes this does not happen, and that's the purpose of the lab, to figure out if the bromines are going on the cis or if the bromines are going on the trans. Now, keep in mind, they're not going to use cis and trans. They use other terminology, which is just a substitute. That's all that it is. So if it's cis on the same side, that's your urethro product. And if it's trans on different sides, that is your 3 product. So that's what they want to know. They want to know which one of these is going to be produced. So your job in this experiment is to brominate transdynamic acid. And then you'll get a product. That product could be the urethro or it could be the 3 version. And you're going to determine which one you have through the process of a melting point determination. That's it. You just need to do a melting point. So you need to clean up the product, get rid of the impurities, dry it out, so that means overnight at least, and then come back the next day and do a melting point. The urethro, which is the opposite sides, or the same side, I'm sorry, the urethro version is 204, and the 3 version is 95. So you can see a huge distinct difference between the melting points. That's almost 100 degrees, right? A 100 degree difference. So there will be no guesswork involved. You'll do a melting point, it will clearly be closer to one than the other, and you will automatically know which one that you've got. Uh, now, if your melting point isn't an exact match, and most of the time when you've done melting point in our laboratory, you'll see that it's not an exact match. There's always a little bit of deviation between them. That's okay. But what if it's like way above or way below the number that's the target? Uh, this is typically due to an impure product. So if your melting point isn't an exact match, that means that you've got a mixture of both 3O and urethro. Uh, so this can happen sometimes, and if it does, you've got an impure product that you probably need to recrystallize once more and then allow that to give you a cleaner, purer product in the end result. So your synthesis target here, uh, this, this reaction is a little bit better as far as yield goes. So we would like you to get a 70% or greater yield associated with the lab. Your melting point error, we would like less than 3%. Uh, if so, then you're pretty good to go. And then did you correctly ID the structure? Did you give us the correct answer of your urethro or 3 -O? based on your melting point analysis. So that is basically the nutshell of the laboratory. You've got transdynamic acid, 
you're going to break this double bond that's right there in the middle, and you're going to add bromine onto the molecule. The bromine can go in the cis form or in the trans form, and it's up to you to figure out which one it is. Uh, but keep in mind, they do not use cis and trans. They use urethro and 3O instead. So good luck with the laboratory. Uh, I think that this is pretty much self-explanatory as, as far as when you get in and actually start doing it. Uh, the problem here is that it is more of a complicated setup. It's just aggravating more than it is complicated, I believe. Uh, and the reaction will go very smoothly with you as long as you do everything right in the beginning. After that, when you crank on the heat, when you start adding your bromine, it's pretty much low maintenance until the recrystallization step comes around. Uh, so I think this is probably one of those labs that you could do in conjunction with another one. So just plan it out and you'll be okay. So if you've got questions, talk to us in the lab. We'll help you along and we'll see you there.